Good morning. It's good to see you all again. Uh, today, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, Genesis and Hebrews um, passages uh, because Abraham has um, become something of a, uh, a, a spirit animal to me. Not, not really, but um, it's just what we would say. But uh, Abraham in the New Testament, Abraham is this... Um, becomes this kind of typological or, or this type or this figure of this is what, um, this is how God interacts with people. That the, the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans and Galatians both looks back on Abraham as, as kind of, he, he looks back and says, oh, it was here. This is exactly how God is interacting with us. And the dynamics in play with Abraham uh, become really important uh, for a Christian. And I was thinking about uh, this passage and today, and I was thinking of this song that came out uh, a few years ago that um, maybe like three people in the room might know. And if you do, come talk to me because we'll be friends. Um, but it's by the band The Killers. Uh, and if you've never heard of the band The Killers, they are uh, they're famous for, uh, they had a couple of songs back like 10 years ago that kind of got big. One was called uh, Somebody Told Me, and they had these brilliant lyrics of... Uh, this was the lyrics of the song. Somebody told me that you had a boyfriend that looked like a girlfriend that I had in February of last year. Like that is, that is some great lyrics right there. Um, but uh, they, are, they are one of my favorite bands despite that. Uh, and they had a song that came out uh, last year called Rut. And the song is the, uh, the lead singer of the band, uh, Brandon Flowers, that are based out of Las Vegas. Uh, he, he wrote this song um, as, as an homage uh, to his wife, who was struggling with clinical depression. And the song is written from the vantage point of, its wife, of his wife, and it's a beautiful song because uh, the chorus of it uh, is, is so simple, but it, it contains such a powerful um, truth about us and human beings and relationships. The chorus says, uh, don't give up on me. I'm just in a rut. I'm climbing, but the walls keep stacking up. And the chorus keeps, uh, as the song goes on, the chorus continually says, don't give up on me. Don't give up on me. And at the very end of the big crescendo of the song, he sings, don't you give up on me. And there's, there's, a, there's so much beauty to me in um, you know, a spouse singing to their spouse saying, I know what I'm going through. I'm being honest about what I'm going through. Don't leave me. Don't give up on me. You know, and is there anything more true to marriage than simply the recognition of, yeah, I know who I am and I know that you know who I am. Please don't give up on me yet. Uh, please don't uh, leave me. Uh, and, and the song has been, every time I listen to it, I almost start crying because of this, just this, um, innate human uh, desire to be known and for someone to know who we are and for someone to not walk away. For someone to really know exactly who we are, the person that we really are, and for them to not uh, walk away. And this, this happens all the time in our lives. This happens all the time in our lives when we, um, when we, uh, you know, we, we put forward a vision of ourselves that we think people will love and we keep all the things tied back that we think people will not. And every now and then, those things will work themselves out in our lives. We cannot, you know, keep that under control perfectly. And we've all known the fear. We've all known the reality of those things leaking out and us and people giving up on us, people walking away from us. And the same thing is true for your relationship with God, that, that you and I, we recognize who we are and that there is a cry in us, God, do not give up on me. Don't give up on me. Uh, I'm not the only one who feels this way. Uh, the um, incredible uh, news source, uh, The Onion, um, uh, which I feel like every time I preach I use The Onion, which, I don't know, uh, it's probably just as ac accurate as any modern news source. But um, this last week they ran a story. So The Onion is, is, the, is actual fake news, not just, uh, but it's actual, like, uh, satirical, it's a sat satirical news site. But it says this. Uh, the last week they ran a story that says, Insecure infant worried he's unworthy of animatronic toy rabbit's love. <laughs> the article says this, Confessing he feels pang, a pang of guilt every time the bunny says, You're my best friend. Infant Justin Weber confirmed Thursday he worries constantly about being unworthy of the deep and of evidently unconditional love shown to him by Hopsy, 
his animatonic Troy Rab toy rabbit. Any day now, quote, any day now, Hopsy will see the real Justin. And when I squeeze his foot, he won't say, I love you, but utter, this isn't working anymore. <laughs> Said the 12-month-old who fears his beloved stuffed animal's ever-present smile would inevitably fade away, and his always outstretched arms would cross protectively in front of his chest at the sight of the baby. Quote, I've seen the way he looks at other babies. Once he actually gets to know me, I just know he'll jump ship for someone cuter and even younger. I don't know. Maybe he's better off with a kid who doesn't forget him at grandma's house or lets the dogs chew on him anyways. At press time, the frustrated infant was repeatedly throwing Hopsy up against the wall only for the damaged, rab damaged rabbit to quietly insist it loves him every time. All right, so I thought that was funny. Uh, but I think it, it does show a, tr a human truth that is, human, that is, that is uh, evident inside the church or outside the church, that we all know that there's two parts of us. We all know that there is a part of us that we put forward to say, you know, here, this is the part of me that I think is worthy of love. This is the part of me that I want you to see. This is the part of me uh, that, that, that I think that you'll really respond well to. And then there's the other part of me. You know, there's the part of us that we, we put forward on the first date. And there's the part of us that we're still trying to kind of keep, you know, around, keep hidden after 35 years of marriage. You know, there's, there's, there's parts of us that we put forward that we think, this is beautiful, this is good, this, is, this, this will earn me love. And then there's the parts of us that we hope nobody ever sees. And that becomes especially, especially toxic when it comes to our relationship with God. Because there are places in our lives where we fear that God might, may, might be close to giving up on us. There are places where we feel like God might be close to walking away. And this is actually what, the, the problem here is actually what the Bible refers to when we live by sight and not by faith. The human problem is that we look at things in the world and we assume God's position towards them. We look at good and beautiful and strong things and we assume because we are attracted to those, that God works the same way. We assume that that is exactly what God is looking for. He's looking for good and strong and beautiful people. He's looking for people that are put together. That's what we are looking for, so that must be what God's looking for. And we also assume that the people who are broken or ugly or, or falling apart, the people who are evil or even wicked, no one uses that word anymore. I think we should bring it back. But um, the, the, that God looks at these people and he must be against them. He must hate them. He must, he must, his anger must be towards them. Uh, and the problem there is, um, and, you know, for the most part, that's, that's, that's okay. We can get through pretty well. There's some things that we can confidently say God does hate. I mean, we, we can look at evil in the world and say God is not for this. But it starts to get us in trouble when we start talking about the gospel because the gospel is actually the declaration that what you see in the world does not necessarily correspond to who God is. The, the, the gospel actually states that God loves sinners, that God loves the broken, that, that it's actually the people who are falling apart who God is closest to, who God is, is coming around. And it's actually in the places where we're experiencing bro brokenness that God is making promises that I will be there with you. So the truth is that um, most of us um, are are unfinished. Most of us um, have some holes, we have some things that are not quite done, and that's what this text kind of talks about, that, that Abraham looked forward to a better city, that he looked forward to a heavenly country, that, that they recognize that this world is not our home. Um, and the experience of being unfinished can also often feel like we've been abandoned. Being, being not quite there yet can feel like, does God, has God given up on me? You know, we're like the, um, the tower off of I-4 in Altamont Springs. Does anyone know this? Like, this guy built this tower, didn't finish it, and just, it's, go it's just there. And it's never going to be, we don't know when it'll ever be finished. Um, or, or you're like, uh, this summer, I, I set out to um, uh, resod my backyard, uh, which was um, a lot of, amb a very ambitious thing to do when you have two kids uh, who constantly need attention. Um, and uh, all I did, basically, I got to, I just tore up my backyard. So right now, it's just one giant dirt mound in my backyard. There's nothing, you know. And uh, it can be easy to look at it and say, 
this, this yard has been abandoned, which it basically has been at this point. But, um, but the difference between being something being unfinished and something being abandoned or condemned or, or ready to be destroyed. The difference uh, on the outside, it might look very similar. You know, on the outside, it might look uh, like all oh, this. They, they might look the same except for the intention of the builder. You know, if it's the intention of the builder to finish it, they're go he's going to finish it. And the same is true for you and I, that, that, that there are places where we look in our lives and we think, this looks like somebody who God has abandoned. You know, I am, the, you know, cancer or, or um, losing your job or your marriage falling apart or, or having, a, you know, a, a relationship with your kids that's strained or ostracized. It looks like God might, might have abandoned us, but maybe he's just not finished. Maybe, maybe that is the very places where God is working. And we see in the gospel that God actually loves the unfinished, that God actually responds to and is close to the broken. So let's first, let's look at Abraham. What is it that Abraham, what is it that we can learn from him? Well, what, what did he have? You know, what is it that Abraham had that, 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 um, that, that, he res, that uh, made him this father of the faith? Well, it, for one, he had nothing, actually. Um, uh, it, it talks about that uh, in verse uh, uh, 12, it says, Therefore, from one person, this one as good as dead, descendants were born. This one, as good as dead. You know, Abraham was in his late 90s. I think Sarah was in her, her early 90s, which from everything we know uh, is not your, like, primary, your prime childbearing years, um, typically. Uh, and uh, he didn't have any children, and God comes to him and says, Abraham, uh, you know, I see that you have many children, and I'm going to bless one. No, he says, no, you have no children. You've never had any children. You have no hope of having children. I promise you. I promise you, through you, I'm going to bring a line that will outnumber the stars. So Abraham has nothing. Abraham is on, this, on the outside. Back then in those cultures, uh, if, you, if you went childless, that was a sign that the gods had abandoned you. That was a sign that you were not, that you were cursed, right? Um, and, uh, and so God comes to this one who on the surface looks like the God would have nothing to do with them. This one looks like one who has been abandoned by God, and he comes to him, and he makes promises. And second, um, what is it that he did? What is it that Abraham did to warrant uh, being justified? You know, the, the Genesis passage says that he was justified um, by his faith. Well, he simply believed. At no point does it say that, that Abraham, um, uh, you know, started following all these rules. You know, God doesn't come to him and say, Abraham, if you do blah, 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 if you start doing this, if you start doing this, if you start tithing, you know, that's a big one. Uh, if, you, if you start following all the rules, then I will bless you. Then I will make you, uh, then I will be your God. Then I will give you children. No. And, and then, you know, Abraham maybe like responds by doing all these things. And, you know, that would be how we would write the story. That Abraham would learn this lesson and that he would respond and then everything would go well. No, the, the actual Bible is much different. Abraham, God comes to him, gives him the promise, and it simply says that he believes. And right there it says he's reckoned as righteous. Which is, a, you know, it's, it's cutting out the whole, you know, thing of if we were writing the story, he'd be reckoned righteous at the end. You know, it'd be like, he, you know, he kind of learned his lesson and over time he kind of got better. And then all of a sudden at the very end of his life, he said, and, you know, he was a righteous man. No, no, no. In that moment, when God tells him that, when he says, I, you know, you will have more uh, children than all the stars, it says that Abraham believed him. And right then he was reckoned. He was declared he was recognized by God as you are righteous forever. I mean, not like a, um, you're, you're righteous right now. He is declared one of the righteous simply by his faith. Now, you may notice that in the Hebrews passage, it says, uh, by faith Abraham obeyed. And so you might think, well, see, it says that he obeyed. So, so our obedience does have some kind of factor in. There's a quote that I love by Martin Luther on faith. Um, and uh, he says this, Instead, faith is God's work in us that changes us and gives us new birth from God. It kills the old Adam and makes us completely different people. It changes our hearts, our spirits, our thoughts, and all our powers. It brings the Holy Spirit with it. Yes, it is a living, creative, active, and powerful thing, this faith. 
Faith cannot help doing good works constantly. It doesn't stop to ask if good works ought to be done, but before anyone asked, it already has done them and continues to do them without ceasing. Anyone who does not do good works in this manner is an unbeliever. He, stum he stumbles around and looks for faith and good works, even though he does not know what faith and good works are. Faith is a living, bold trust in God's grace. So certain of God's favor that it would risk death of a thousand times trusting it. Such confidence and knowledge of God's grace makes you happy, joyful, and bold in your relationship to God and all creatures. And so what's he saying? He's saying that, yes, obedience, has, uh, obedience is going to happen. You know, you're, you're going to see, but, but obedience flows forth from faith. We don't obey so that we believe. We obey because we believe that, that our, actions are, our actions are downstream from our beliefs. What we believe about the world is what directs us how we act in the world. And that as you and I are created as creatures, new creatures of faith, people who trust God at his word, then, then suddenly good, for, good works, you know, they spring up. You don't have to go pursuing them. You will do them. You don't have to kind of look around and like, how, how can I do a good work? I want to do a good work. I need to do a good work. You will begin to do them almost naturally, almost to where you don't even notice them. In fact, for some of you, uh, the person, the way that you're going to know that you're a little bit closer to being finished, the way that you're going to know that you are moving forward is not by you looking in the mirror, but by your spouse or your kid or your employee. People that would be like, you know, there's just something about them that's a little bit different now. They're a little bit softer now. They're a little bit uh, kinder now. They're, they're a little bit more compassionate than they were before. Sometimes we're the last ones to notice what God is doing in our lives, which is why we need the church, which is why we need people to come around us and remind us and tell us the truth of what God is doing in us. But lastly, it was not Abraham's faith in nothing that saved him. It wasn't a generic sense of trust. It wasn't like a George Michael, you just got to have faith. You know, faith in general. You know, we just want to have more faith. And, and, and this, is, this is like one of my biggest pet peeves um, in uh, kind of Christianity at large today. We talk a lot about faith. We talk a lot about like, well, you got to have faith. We, you know, we, we want people to have more faith. How do I grow my faith? How do, I, how do I step out in faith? We use faith as these abstract, you know, things. Uh, we, we talk about faith as this, like, gaseous cloud that we can kind of grab hold of. Oh, and now I have uh, faith. Um, he, he doesn't have, it's, it's, very, it's very important to know what does Abraham have faith in. I mean, that's Jesus' whole thing when he says, says faith in a mustard seed. You know, he's saying the, 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 the amount of faith you have is completely uh, beside the point. That, that faith must be placed in something. And it's what you're placing your faith in that actually matters. And for Abraham, what we see is uh, that the Christianity on the, on the ground works. It's the simplest thing that you'll ever see, experience. That all Abraham did was hear the promises of God to him. And he trusted it. All Abraham did was hear God himself say something to him. I will do this. I will be your God and you will be my people. I will make you a great nation. All Abraham did was hear God say, I will do this. And Abraham believed him. I think you will. I believe that you will. I know that it doesn't make sense. I know that it doesn't look like, actually look like in my world, like that could happen. I know that me and my wife are way too old to have children, but I believe you. If you're saying that you're going to do it, I believe you. And it's, so, and it's so important to understand that the promise did not come true because Abraham had faith. That God, gave, that God did not come to Abraham and say, if you believe me, then I will make you a great nation. He comes to him and says, I will. And this is true because Abraham's wife, Sarah, uh, does anyone, if you remember from the story, it wasn't in today's reading, but when she hears the promise, does anyone remember what she does? She laughs. Like... I mean, does this guy understand, you know, how this works? Uh, this, is not, this is not going to happen. You know, she laughs. 
Um, and does God then say, okay, well, you didn't believe me, so Abraham, we're going to need you to find a new wife? No. No, because, because God's promise is not contingent on her faith in it. That God had already promised, no, I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm going to do this, and if you trust me, that's, it's going to go really well for you. I mean, if, if you trust me, your life is going to be so much different uh, than, than, uh, than, than if you didn't trust me. If you constantly were w wondering and looking around and trying to figure out. And there were plenty of points when Abraham, his trust was vague at best. He's looking around at his servant. And he's like, well, maybe that could, should be my heir. Or he has an Ishmael, and he's like, maybe this should be my heir. And God's like, no, I promise it would come through Sarah, and I promise I would do this. And so the promises of God are not contingent on your faith in them. They are contingent on God's faithfulness. They are contingent on whether God is true to his word. That the promises of God are true if God is true. And the thing that we know is that God is true. That God does not lie. There's a, one of my favorite theologians, um, D.A. Carson, he told this story once uh, about... Um, the, the, Egyptian, the Israelites in the Passover. And he was telling the story that he kind of said, that, you know, remember, the, uh, God comes to them and says, you know, during the Passover, I'm going to send the angel of death. It's going to kill the firstborn child of all of Egypt. Uh, if you take the blood of a, of a lamb and you paint it over your doorpost, uh, then I will pass over your house. And, and, and God's judgment will not come upon this house. And uh, D.A. Carson talks about how, you know, he, he, he fictionally kind of imagines what if there's two, a conversation between two, uh, two Jewish men, you know, right before the, the sun was going to go down, they're going to go back in their house and they're talking. And one of them says, um, well, have you heard about this whole Passover thing? I mean, this is, uh, is kind of crazy stuff. And the other one says, yeah, yeah, it's pretty, pretty intense. And, uh, and the, the, the one says, um, well, uh, you know, I just, I just don't know about it. I mean, it just it all seems... Uh, so arbitrary, and, and um, I, I'm still pretty nervous. I'm kind of nervous about what's going to happen. I mean, I'm still going to paint the thing over the door because he told me to do it, but I'm, I'm pretty terrified. The other one says, I, I'm not, not afraid at all. I have, uh, I have utter confidence. God said that he would pass over. He's going to pass over. And so, yeah, I'll paint it on my doorpost, and I'm not, I'm not afraid. And the question is, which one did God pass over? Both of them. Because God's saving act is not contingent on their faith in it. It was contingent on the blood of the Lamb. And the promises of God for you, the promises of God in your life, the promises of God that were given to you as a baby before you'd ever done anything in baptism, the promises of God that were given to your children in baptism, the promises of God that were given to you every day that you come to church. The promises of God that are given to you right now. That God, as this text even said, that God is not ashamed to be your God. That you are His. And you, he, you belong to Him. The promises of God that say that Christ died for you. And that He will not give up on you. Those promises are not contingent on you even believing them. They're contingent on a faithful God who comes to you and says, I will. I will save you. No matter what it looks like in your life, no matter what it looks like in your marriage, no matter what it looks like in your relationship with your kids, no matter what it looks like, even on your deathbed, no matter what it looks like, I promise, I have bound myself to you in a promise that says, I will save you. I will love you. And I will never, ever give up on you. Amen. Amen.